thank you all for taking the time to join the webinar today. Uh, my name is Sawyer Miller. I am a senior manager here at RISC 360. Um, I oversee the ISO service line. Um, so I've worked with uh, a lot of clients on uh, ISO 27001 and other uh, frameworks, but we wanted to put together a webinar series on ISO 27001, which is uh, focused on information security. Um, so, you know, hopefully this uh, this webinar is uh, helpful to you. Again, this will be a four part series that we uh, put out a, a single part each month. Um, so you guys can look for uh, the subsequent videos uh, after this one. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and jump in. So the first part of this series is intended to really just introduce you to the standard. Um, so a lot of times, you know, we are working um, in Maybe you're in security, maybe you're in compliance, uh, maybe you have just been given some security and compliance duties. Um, but a lot of times, you know, when someone sees ISO 27001 for the first time, uh, it can be a lot to take in. Uh, you may not really uh, have a grasp of what that takes um, or what the benefits can be to your company. And so we're going to attempt to, to try to break that down for everyone uh, the best way that we can. So our agenda for today, uh, we'll first talk about what is ISO 27001. Uh, what's the, the purpose of it? Uh, who's sort of the intended uh, audience for that? Uh, what's the business case for it? Why would uh, you as a business care about spending money and time and resources on something like this? Uh, we'll talk through briefly the steps to achieve uh, compliance with ISO. Um, we'll also talk about a typical timeline for achieving that compliance. Um, it'll be you know, different based on the organization and where you are, but we'll break down uh, a generalized timeline so you can uh, estimate that. We'll also talk about effort estimates. So who is going to be involved? Uh, how much time can they expect to uh, dedicate or contribute to the effort? Um, and then lastly, we'll just do sort of a framework overview uh, where we talk about how ISO 27001 uh, relates to uh, other parts of the standard uh, in the 27000 series. All right, so first is what is ISO 27001? Um, we'll talk uh, in a couple slides about sort of the ISO ecosystem, but suffice to say for now, uh, there's an organization called ISO, it's the International Standards Organization that uh, basically creates standards on all kinds of things. Um, information security is just one of many, many things that they create standards on. There's a lot of uh, like ESG standards, uh, everything from, you know, uh, food, you know, handling and production to quality management, um, things like that. So there's a lot of standards out there. Um, the organization aims to create um, sensible ways of achieving a, a call it a uh, accepted standard for whatever the topic is. And so with information security, if you uh, and your organization process information uh, that's in any way, shape, or form sensitive, you probably have stakeholders who care about the security of that. So I said 27001 specifically is an information security management system. Um, it's an international standard, as I mentioned. Um, ISO is an international organization, so it's recognized worldwide. Uh, you do actually get a certification. So there are some standards where you can self-attest and say that you have met the requirements of that standard. Uh, but you may not have an actual independently verified certification uh, that you can hand to a stakeholder. Um, and it's also uh, broken down into annual cycles. So you'll have annual audits to uh, at first attain and then to retain the certification. Um, so 27001 is broken into really two main parts. The first is clauses four through 10. Um, we'll talk about what those are here in a minute, uh, but the, the cool thing about clauses four through 10 is that a lot of the ISO management systems uh, follow the same structure. You'll see those same sort of headers for each clause um, in a lot of different management system standards that ISO has published. Um, so we'll, we'll go through what those are, but it's really uh, interesting and unique to me that they've sort of honed in on uh, you know, the, the six elements that it takes to stand up a management system of any kind. Um, and then there's also at the bottom of the document, uh, which, by the way, if you've not downloaded the document, you can go to ISO.org uh, and get that. Uh, highly recommend that. Um, if you, if this acronym has come up, if you're hearing this for the first time, uh, it's relatively cheap. It's, you know, $100 to $200, um, <clears throat> and that standard is the rule book, right? It's, it's everything. There, there's really no secrets. You can see everything that an auditor is going to use to audit you against. 
Uh, but at the bottom of that document, you'll notice uh, the Annex A. And this is actually the part of the standard that a lot of people think of when they think of information security. These are all of your like nitty gritty controls, the you know access control, asset management, business continuity, incident management, uh, all of the different things that it sort of takes to operate uh, a set of controls to keep the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data secure. Um, but you're actually certifying clauses four through 10. So, so that's something that a lot of folks miss. They think that uh, ISO will just be sort of a set of controls you'll implement uh, and then get audited against. Uh, but what auditors are really going to want to see and what the best programs out there do is they really take clauses four through 10 to heart and they supplement the risk identified as a part of those clauses with the Annex A controls. All right, so why should you care about this, right? What is it that um, ISO can do for your business? Um, one of the biggest things is it helps you build a, a true security risk management program. Um, you know, no one wants to be in the news for uh, being breached or losing, you know, client data or exposing consumer data or things like that. So um, if you don't have a framework in place right now, um, it's just people doing best effort, um, which is fine. A lot of businesses start there because uh, you have to start somewhere. ISO 27001 truly is a framework to consider because um, it's unique in that you can use the efforts uh, that you put into standing up an ISO 27001 program to consume other frameworks down the road. Uh, so as your stakeholders' compliance requirements grow and evolve, uh, you'll be well positioned to consume those. Um, it helps build that customer trust, um, and it can also offset some of your due diligence. So if you're familiar with getting a security questionnaire from a prospect during a sales cycle, you know what I'm talking about. Um, these things can be you know, a few questions to hundreds of questions, um, and they can be very time consuming to answer. Some of them, depending on who you're selling to, um, may actually even ask for evidence. So you may be going through multiple audits a year in the form of client due diligence because they're not, you know, client A is not going to take client B's due diligence uh, as satisfactory. They're going to do their own. However, that's the idea behind ISO uh, 27001 is that you can get certified and hand them that certificate. And that is an independent attestation that you've implemented those controls and uh, that management system. So a lot of times clients will take that, uh, maybe not in, in place of all of the due diligence they're going to do, but in place of a lot of it. So it might save you a lot of time there. Um, again, it also helps you, you know, consume other frameworks. We'll talk about that more later and in some of the future webinars, but that's one of the unique, uh, call it characteristics of ISO 27001 versus other frameworks out there. Um, and then on top of that, it's a competitive advantage. We're seeing a ton of uh, organizations, um, not just here in the US, but across the world who are pursuing ISO 27001 because stakeholder concern with data security um, is growing, uh, right? We, we, I think, unless you've lived under a rock in the last five years, you, you've heard, you know, security and privacy in the news and the headlines. Um, you know, you hear about big businesses being breached, you know, uh, things that come to mind are like the you know, credit bureau breach that happened not long ago. Um, there's, there's just a lot of risk out there that needs to be managed in the form of, uh, of data. And so companies and organizations are looking for a way to do that and tell the world that they've done that. And so that's why we're seeing this rapid adoption across the globe. So let's break down the ISO ecosystem. Um, <clears throat> you actually, if you're an organization who's seeking certification, you're only going to interact with uh, those bottom two boxes here. So um, you'll interact with potentially consulting company like RISC 360. Um, these are companies who can come in and help you understand the framework, understand the standard, assess your gaps, uh, help you with risk assessments. You know, they can help you build the program from the ground up. Um, you'll then present this in an, uh, something called an external audit to a certification body. Um, there are a lot of them out there. You can check out the link here to go see those uh, that are accredited to be certification bodies. And that's one of the things you want to make sure you do is that when you get certified, you use an accredited certification body. Um, otherwise, you run the risk of prospects not uh, taking that as um, a reputable certification. Now, the organizations that you don't interact with typically as a company um, are the accreditation bodies. So two of the most notable are ANAB and UCAS. These actually oversee the certification bodies. Um, so your external auditor gets audited by the accreditation bodies and they make sure that they're following the ISO standards written for certification bodies, that they're performing their audits um, in the appropriate way, that they are uh, you know, 
uh, up allocating appropriate amounts of resources that they're you know drawing conclusions in a standardized fashion um so that's what's so cool about iso is you don't just have this body of auditors that can kind of do what they want they're beholden to the accreditation bodies and then at the top level again is the the iso standards uh, organizations who govern those accreditation bodies so there really is a lot of oversight um, there's a lot of collaboration that has to take place but in my opinion it creates a pretty clean um, ecosystem uh, so again if you're at the very bottom just know that there's a lot that goes into an iso standard it's not just a you know some certification body who comes out and audits you um, there's a, a lot of uh, sort of links in that chain so breaking down the standard, um, as I mentioned, it's, it's really two parts, right? The first part is clauses four through 10, uh, commonly referred to as the ISMS, the Information Security Management System. Um, these are the uh, topics basically that it takes to determine or, or to, to stand up sort of a, a governance structure. You can think about this as building a machine or building like an assembly line that can then consume raw materials and crank out controls and all the right things that you need to manage risk. Um, this is not like, uh, you know, one or zero type stuff. This isn't, you know, did you do a user access review? Yes or no. Those are the Annex A controls. The ISMS is broken into uh, the clauses four through 10, um, which I'll cover. So the first is context of the organization. If you're gonna stand up an information security management system uh, or a security program, you need to establish the context. Who cares about the program operating effectively? Uh, is it clients, prospects, uh, you know, board members, um, other executives within the company? Um, you, know, are, like, who, you know, are there regulatory bodies, uh, channel partners? There's a lot of internal and external uh, stakeholders that you need to explicitly define. Um, and then you need to also determine why they care. Um, that's a really important piece of this whole thing is determining, you know, what do my prospects care about? Um, and that's how you really scope. A lot of times I, I work with clients and I hear this question that comes up a lot, which is, how do I scope my ISMS? What is the scope of our ISO 27001 certification? Um, and a lot of times we lean towards defining it in terms of products, right? I have SAS product A or SAS product B that I want to certify. And that's a good way to think about it. But at the end of the day, what they really care about, they being the stakeholders, is that you've defined where the data goes that they want protected. And so anywhere that's processed or touched, uh, that needs to be included. So that's why you'll include support functions typically, such as internal IT. Um, you know, it may be, uh, you know, infrastructure management stuff where you say, well, you know, our clients manage all their own infrastructure because we do on-premise solutions, uh, but they still care about the delivery of that up to the point where you hand it off to them uh, and the security along the way. So that's that's why a lot of things uh, could wind up being in scope that you may not consider out of the gate. So just think through that. Clause five is leadership. Um, there's a very specific term uh, called top management in the 27001 standard. Um, this is basically, uh, something you need to define and you need to assign to someone. So top management means the topmost uh, representative in the organization who's going to oversee and be accountable for the operation of the ISMS at the end of the day. A lot of times I see, you know, uh, a chief information security officer, if you don't have one of those, it could be a CIO, a CTO, something like that. Um, but it's usually gonna be a C-level executive who uh, oversees the program and typically reports to uh, peers at that C-level. Um, Clause six is planning. So this is where you define uh, your risks as an organization and you define what the objectives and goals of the program are. So uh, a risk assessment is a really big part of the ISMS. Um, the idea is that you would conduct a risk assessment, identify all of the risks to the data that you've defined in the scope by going through clause four, um, and you would then determine what are the controls necessary to apply in order to protect that data from the risks that we've identified. Um, you'll also def define what are the overall objectives of your security program. Um, a lot of times these get misaligned from business objectives and it should be the opposite, right? Um, if you do it right, your security objectives should actually support your business objectives. So a good example there might be, you know, we'd like to expand business into uh, the EU. Well, that has considerations, right? There's certain things about maybe data localization or you know, handling PII or things like that that you need to consider. 
Um, and so you would want to write security objectives that support that business objective. Um, if you have a security program that's operating just for the sake of compliance to check a box, um, I guarantee you it's not doing the things for your business that it could be doing. Uh, clause seven is about support. So this is making sure that the program has what it needs to operate in the form of people, tools, money, time, you know, processes, whatever it may be. Um, documentation, that's a really big part of it. Uh, making sure that documentation is handled in a controlled and consistent manner. Um, all of that is, is defined in Clause 7. Clause 8 is operation. Um, it's, it's almost a follow-on to Clause 6, but it basically talks about operationalizing all of the plans that you've set forth in Clause 6. Um, so those two closely relate. Clause 9 is, uh, that's actually where your internal audit comes into play. Um, and Clause 9 is broken into three sections. It's 9.1, 9.2, and 9.3. 9.1 is your self-evaluation activities. Uh, certification bodies and the standard call for some version of self-evaluation where you're measuring your program yourself. Um, usually that's the core team, the compliance team, the security and compliance team, whatever it is uh, that's going through, talking to control owners and measuring how well they think the program's doing. Clause 9.2 is your internal audit. Um, this is a, a nuanced clause. Um, you have to have an independent party perform your internal audit. That party has to be qualified to do so. They have to demonstrate that they're qualified to do so, and uh, they cannot have operated any of your controls. Um, so if you operate some of the controls, you work with control owners, you help do user access reviews, um, from a technical sense, you're gonna be uh, ruled out of being able to perform that internal audit. So that's something that um, we as RISC360 are engaged to do a lot, is come in and perform that independent internal audit. Uh, clause 9.3 is management review. So this is where, again, that top management term comes up. You're going you're gonna, to uh, basically uh, present to top management um, KPIs, measurements, uh, conclusions, things like that about the ISMS to make sure that they are apprised of status of how this is operating. Um, there's actually some pretty cool stuff you can do with tying in Clause 6 and 9.3, uh, where you can align your KPIs to your security objectives, which align to business objectives, and then have a template where you go through a management review each quarter. Um, and it checks a lot of the boxes of the standard, but it's also a really efficient way and an effective way to present your security program to any given stakeholder, not just top management. Um, and then clause 10 is about improvement. So this is, when you sign up for a, a ISO 27001 certification and for most ISO standards, um, it's an ongoing commitment. Um, the initial cycle is three years. There's the certification year and then your two surveillance years. Um, but in general, you're not gonna to wanna to lose that ISO certification. You're gonna to wanna to maintain it. And so one of the things that you are um, tasked with doing is determining how can we continue to improve this program? And so that's you know, things like taking your audit results, uh, you know, digesting those, moving forward with you know, corrective actions that'll improve the posture of the program, uh, coming up with new plans and projects, things that uh, are going to further reduce the risk. And then the second part, um, I won't go into all of these, um, but suffice to say there's 114 security controls in, in uh, what is now the um, prior uh, 27002 standard. And I'll, I'll talk about how those relate in a second. But right now, if you go out today and you download ISO 27001, you'll see 114 controls in Annex A. Uh, they span everything from security policies, uh, organization of the information to HR security, do you screen folks accordingly? Uh, do you make sure that you know employment agreements are written in a way where they know what their security responsibilities are? Asset management, that's laptops, servers, infrastructure, networking gear, whatever it is, uh, you know, badges, uh, do you manage those assets in certain ways? Access control, that's physical access and logical access of all kinds within the scope of the ISMS. Um, cryptography, that's do you have a policy to manage your uh, cryptographic uh, posture? as well as specific procedures written for key management. And keys can be anything from encryption keys to you know, digital signature keys, API keys, um, SSL certificates, things like that. Physical and environmental security, exactly what it sounds like. That's where a lot of times uh, if you're asked to do a physical walkthrough of an office space or a data center, um, or where you might have some compute resources, that's because of the Annex uh, 11 requirements. Uh, 12 is operation security. This covers a lot of the um, it almost feels like a lot of the topics that uh, didn't neatly fit into the other categories. So it's things like vulnerability management, data backup, um, 
you know, operating procedures, uh, things like that. Uh, 12 is one of those categories that you'll probably spend a lot of time in because a lot of the high risk areas, especially for SaaS companies are in that category. Uh, 13 is communication security. It's uh, said another way is network security. Um, 14 is systems acquisition, development and maintenance. This is like, uh, you know, this, this is usually where your SDLC comes into play if you're you know, creating SaaS products or software. Um, but in general, any systems that you're acquiring, developing, or maintaining, uh, there's controls there to fit that. Uh, 15 is vendor management. So this is, you know, making sure that your downstream security posture is good. Um, your customers and prospects are going to want you to make sure that anyone downstream from you that's processing their data are doing it in a secure way. So they put that burden on you because they don't have a relationship with that third party. So they expect you to, to handle that. Um, 16 is incident management. When something happens, what do you do? Uh, and then how do you learn from it and keep it from happening again? 17 is business continuity. So this is, uh, um, a lot of times people think of disaster recovery um, and like availability as business continuity. And that's true, it's a part of it. Uh, but one commonly missed piece of this section is its information security aspects of business continuity. So you wanna make sure that you're uh, maintaining uh, security control posture in the event of an adverse situation. And then 18 is compliance. That's legal, regulatory compliance, things like that. All right, uh, so the implementation process is uh, pretty straightforward. The first is planning. Again, you wanna scope this accordingly. You wanna make sure that you know who your stakeholders are and what the scope of the ISMS is. Uh, the next is the current state assessment. So now that you have the scope defined, you'd assess that scoped uh, information set or, or systems or products, whatever it is, uh, against the standard to determine where your gaps are. That's going to help you create this next piece, which is the remediation. Uh, we, we call it the remediation roadmap. Uh, but it's basically the checklist of things that you need to do to get ready for certification. Um, and then you'll actually execute on that, right? So typically you're gonna spend a couple of months on the you know, planning and the current state assessment, maybe a few weeks on remediation planning. And then you're gonna spend a bulk of your time actually closing the gaps, right? Actually committing to the action plans um, and, and standing up the controls that will actually uh, be audited by the external cert uh, certifying body. And then once you get to uh, the point where you're ready to be certified, that process is broken into uh, four steps as well. Again, planning, you'll need to communicate to them uh, what the, um, scope of the ISMS is, all the in-scope departments, the headcount, things like that. They need that detail to adhere to the ISO standards that they must, uh, that they must answer to as well. Um, and then you'll move into, for the first year, for your certification year, two stages. There's a stage one audit, which is where the certifying body comes out and they basically assess the design of your program. Um, they should not be calling out gaps here. And I wanna repeat that. If you have a certification body who calls out a gap here, um, that they say is going to be a non-conformity, um, you should challenge them on that because they should only be calling out what the standard calls areas of concern. Uh, stage two, which is the next step, is where they will actually be able to call out a non-conformity. So if something is called out in stage one, you should have the opportunity to correct that prior to stage two uh, to avoid that being documented as a formal non-conformity. Um, again, if, if a certification body is telling you something different, challenge them on it. Um, that can help you, you know, have a cleaner report. It can help you, you know, have a, a much uh, smoother stage two process as well. Um, I will say though, in stage one, it's not going to be near as in depth as stage two. So they're not going to look at everything in stage one. So, so don't think of stage one as like a, a safety net by any means. Um, but if there are things that come up there, um, address those before stage two, and it shouldn't be an issue. Stage two is when they're going to spend a bulk of their time. So stage one is usually like a day or two. Stage two is usually going to be a dedicated week, uh, at least. And you're going to spend a lot of time with the auditors. Uh, you're going to submit a lot of evidence. They're going to cover all of the clauses four through 10 uh, in depth, um, similar to how they did in stage one, but they're going to start asking a lot more show me type questions versus just talk about it. And they're going to assess all of the in scope Annex A controls. Um, so that's where you'll spend a lot of your time. And then uh, you'll receive your certification decision. So timeline, I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, usually you're going to spend, you know, anywhere from two to four weeks planning, determining what are uh, 
what are the stakeholders that I'm concerned about here, what's the data that they care about, and determining the scope. Um, you'll usually spend between one and two months on the current state assessment, um, which you know can serve as your internal audit as well, um, basically determining where your gaps in the program are. Um, if you don't think you're quite ready for such a formal engagement, you can do your own current state assessment. I'll talk about a, a great tool for that uh, here in a minute. Um, but then again, as I mentioned, you'll spend a bulk of your time on remediation um, and then a stage one and a stage two audit. Usually there's between 30 and 60 days between stage one and stage two. Um, but in general, if this is all brand new to you, if you've just been tasked with uh, achieving ISA certification, um, a, a good like back of the napkin math number to budget is a full year from the date that you start this to actually getting a certification in hand that you can hand to a, a client or a prospect. All right, I promised some effort estimates. Um, so who's gonna be impacted, right? You may be the sole person from your business sitting on this webinar because you're the one tasked with figuring this whole thing out. So what are you gonna have to ask others for? Uh, leadership can expect to spend um, at least two to four hours on the, the actual audit. So this is effort estimates scoped to the external audit you're gonna go through. So leadership will spend uh, between two and four hours. They want to hear from top management. They wanna hear them discuss how they uh, receive the information about the program and make those strategic decisions. The security and GRC team is gonna carry a lion's share of the work. Um, they're gonna be working closest with the auditors, submitting evidence, coordinating with other control owners, things like that. IT, uh, we're talking about information security, so there's a lot of IT resources uh, involved there. So naturally, they spend a good bit of time on walkthroughs and gathering evidence. Um, engineering, development, uh, you know, whatever you, you call the sort of uh, that side of the house, um, they're going to be spending some time collecting, you know, change tickets and, uh, you know, design documents and things like that, especially if you're a SaaS business. Um, if you use a ticketing system like a Jira or GitHub or something, you'll be uh, spending a lot of time pulling information out of there, demonstrating to the auditor that that stuff's working. Um, and then you have a lot of support functions like HR, legal, facilities, um, and all together, they're going to spend between five and 10 hours of demonstrating um, operations of those controls. And so I promised a, a cool resource for you. Um, again, if this is brand new to you, I heavily, uh, heavily encourage you to go to phalanxgrc.com and check out our free GRC platform. Um, this is basically, uh, in my opinion, the, the best way and the most efficient way to determine without having to engage any external parties, determine where you are against the standard. This will help you uh, really level set yourself and others who are curious about this in your organization with what it's gonna take to get from where you are today to certified. Um, when you go and sign up, you can actually do a self-assessment of ISO 27001 standard Basically, you'll respond to questions uh, in a questionnaire, and it's going to provide you with a report card. It'll actually say, hey, you're doing great, or here's where you need improvement. Um, and we, I mean, you know, us as a business, uh, ha we've been doing ISO assessments for years. We've done hundreds of them. Um, and we've taken all that knowledge and experience and put it into these self-assessments. So these are, these are handcrafted um, ISO self-assessments that cost you nothing. So again, if, if you're really curious where you are, take the time to go in, sign up for that, complete that assessment to get that report card and to actually also receive recommendations. We'll tell you what you need to do to fix these things. So again, it's very possible that you don't need to engage any consulting firm. You don't need to engage anyone in order to uh, fix this stuff. Um, but even if you do, you're always gonna be, it's gonna be better to go into that situation eyes wide open versus uh, depending on someone else to tell you where you stand. Um, so we, we feel like this is a big uh, needle mover for the market. We gen genuinely want to see companies get more secure. Uh, you know, we care about information security. Um, and so we, we really wanted to put this out to the market and give people some very valuable resources for free. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, yeah, and so that's the, that's the end of uh, the presentation today. So uh, I think we'll turn over to some questions. Um, there's a question section in the GoToWebinar if you wanted to type some things in there um, that you might be curious about. And I think uh, so there we actually have, we have four questions so far. Uh, so the first question is, uh, do you have any other content on ISO that you can share? Yeah, so uh, actually if you go to risk360.com, um, spelled like you see in the top right there, the, the number three, the word 60, 
um, and you look under the resources tab, there's a, a lot of stuff there. We have a lot of content, blogs, white papers, videos, things like that that we've produced uh, that just educate you. Um, but there's also some very specific training resources. Like we actually have, uh, we've called it the ISO Masterclass. Um, and Christian Hyatt, one of our co-founders, breaks down uh, actually every section of controls and talks about each individual control and what it takes to implement those. So, um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there that you can use uh, to educate yourself on the standard. Okay. Um, yeah, we have a lot of more questions coming in. This is great. Um, what is the difference between ISO and SOC 2? Yeah, that's a good one. So SOC 2 is um, a reporting framework that's governed by the AICPA, uh, which is the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, I think. Um, but basically, it's a, it's a framework that will say guarantees a consistent reporting method on uh, some given type of criteria. Um, so SOC 2, a lot of times, is a, it's a listing of controls that you're going to take and consume and try to operationalize, and then you'll demonstrate the operations of those to a SOC 2 auditor. Um, in my opinion, the biggest difference is the focus on um, the actual management system in ISO versus just the uh, opinion of the SOC 2 auditor. So the outcome of a SOC 2 audit is uh, a long report that demonstrates um, anywhere that you might have had what they call exceptions. Those are similar to nonconformities. Um, but at the end of the day, what you're really getting is an opinion that is uh, you know, meant to be accredited and, and uh, meant to be respectable because it follows the SOC 2 framework. Uh, but that opinion is really what you're collecting at the end of the day. And the opinion of the SOC 2 auditor is uh, either that your you know, program is operating as intended in the way that management describes it, or there's issues with it. Um, you know, there's a lot of specific terms to SOC 2 that you can break down, uh, but that's sort of what you get out of a SOC 2 audit. Sometimes you may not want to share that SOC 2 report with clients. Uh, there may be things in there that you're not proud of, or things that you, you know, maybe disagree with the auditor on, or you know, what have you. Um, with ISO, uh, it, it's a little different in that the certificate is a certification. It's not just someone's opinion. It's that they are attesting that you have certified this program uh, to meet all of the requirements of uh, ISO 27001. Um, it comes in the form of a one pager. So um, you can hand that one pager to a client. They can verify that with your certification body. Um, and then if they want, they can ask for more detail. Um, but it's a much, in my opinion, cleaner way of handing off, uh, you know, an attestation of, of your program's effectiveness. Um, but again, the other thing I mentioned is like uh, the clauses four through 10 are written in a way where your security program will operate regardless of the requirements that it has. So you may have some very secure data, some very sensitive data that the NXA controls don't fully cover, right? Um, clauses four through 10 are written in a way that uh, puts the onus on you of determining what your program needs as a whole. And so by operationalizing and putting into practice those clauses four through 10, uh, you're gonna have a, a, a really good foundation to consume any other, not just security, but other you know, privacy or quality or business continuity uh, requirements that come down the pipe later. And I am biased because I, I do work mostly with ISO, so. So we have another good question here, but you have any examples or templates of policies? We do, yeah. So within, um, actually within the Phalanx uh, GRC uh, platform that we have, um, we have a, a whole lot of uh, templates that um, are going to get you, you know, pretty good 50, 60, 70 percent solutions. Um, we're never going to advocate for taking a template blindly. Um, you may only need one or two templates. You may need all of them. But at the end of the day, what you have to do is sit down and, and go through the thinking exercise of what is this policy intended to do and what does right look like for us? If you're a 50 person company, your information security policy is going to look very different than a 50,000 person company, right? But ISO is written in a way that's meant to cater to both. So you have to sit down and really think through policies. Um, the templates are great. And, you know, we, again, we do believe there's a lot of value in the templates we offer. Um, 
but I caution you like on some of these websites and stuff where you can go and just download an ISMS packet of templates, pay them a thousand bucks or whatever it is, um, and you have an ISO program. That's really not gonna fly with most of the certification bodies uh, because you need to, again, sit down and do the thinking exercise of what is my security program um, and what, what does right look like for us? Um, but having those topics sort of seeded with some template language can really help expedite that process. We have another good question here. Um, do you suggest ISO 27001 audit for a small organization? So it depends. Um, it depends on who you're trying to sell to mostly. Um, it, it, I'll put it this way. If it's not a revenue driver, then probably not. Um, you want to make sure that you're spending money where it makes sense. Um, you know, if you are trying to sell to Fortune 500 and you're a startup, um, it may just have to be ta table stakes, right? It just depends on um, who's asking for it and why. So again, like most things, if you can justify it because it's gonna bring in additional revenue, then it, it's almost a no brainer, right? But you do have to perform that ROI calculation of what's it gonna take from an investment perspective to stand this up and what's it gonna get us as a business? Um, security is great, but if it, if it can't be uh, paid for, then you know, it's almost a moot point. All right, here's another good one too. Um, I've read there are going to be changes to ISO standard by October 2022. Um, should we wait for to get our certification or should we do it now? Yeah, that is a great question. So, um, and I'm glad that was brought up. I, I promised to talk about 27002 a little bit. So ISO 27002 is another document that you can buy from ISO. Again, probably 100, 200 bucks. Um, and it actually breaks out all of those Annex A controls from 27001 um, in, in detail. And it talks about how each control can be implemented. It's, uh, it's, they basically give what they call implementation guidance. You know, for user access reviews, here's things to consider. It talks about, you know, reviewing administrative rights more frequently than general rights. Uh, like there's a lot of good notes in there to think about as you're implementing controls. Um, so that's what 27002 is, is implementation guidance. What's happened is that that document has been officially updated by ISO. Uh, and I think it was March of this year, they put out a new control set in 27,002, a new set of controls with implementation guidance. Now, the sort of limbo situation we're in right now is 27,001 has not yet been updated. So currently, Annex A of 27,001 and the controls spelled out in 27,002 don't match. We fully expect uh, that at, at least by the end of the year, that 27,001 is going to be updated with an Annex A that also uh, matches the controls laid out in the new 27,002 published document. Um, to answer the question, should you wait? Uh, I, I would really say no. Um, I would say move forward with the current control set, uh, mainly because again, it doesn't matter what your control set is. You're still gonna have to do a lot of the core things like stand up a risk management program, uh, put together a leadership committee who you know, is focused on program measurement. Um, you know, There's a lot of like governance elements that are not gonna change. Uh, they're agnostic of that control set. Furthermore, what we expect to happen is that there will be a, a roughly a two year cutover period um, that organizations will have to migrate from the current Annex A control set in 27002 to the new controls laid out in the new uh, 27002 document. Um, so I would say, you know, if, again, if you've got revenue on the line, especially don't wait, just implement this stuff. And you're going to still have probably 80% or more overlap of the, we'll call it legacy control set that's still in 27001 and the new ones in 27002. Uh, we actually have a follow-up question to that. Like, yeah. Do we have any resources um, about the update? To Yes. So there's a lot of them out there. We just published a blog on it. Uh, we've got a white paper coming out soon. Um, also something that we're putting together for clients um, is like a transition package. So, uh, you know, if you know anything about RISC 360, we do um, professional services uh, for a lot of different things. ISO 27001 being one of those. Um, and so we actually have like a transition package that we're building where we'll execute with clients, um, you know, a series of things that will help them migrate if they've established those legacy controls and they're looking to move to, move to the new control set. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of great content out there. Again, go to that same resources tab on the RIS360 website to find those. All right, another good question. Does it gap 
a DAP assessment from ISO ensure compliance on different standards? Hmm. Not necessarily. Um, there's always nuances, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, let's say within your uh, access control policy, you state that um, you know access reviews are to be conducted uh, semi-annually. ISO is going to audit you against your own policy language there because the way that it works is they put the onus on you to determine what does right look like for each of the control sets. But let's say you have a, con a SOC 2 program and the control states that um, management shall perform a uh, user access review uh, and approve any changes semi-annually. You would actually have to demonstrate those really nuanced words in that control for SOC 2 if you go into that audit um, without editing that control. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that with ISO, you can right size things in a, in a sense that um, you're able to demonstrate that you're doing what you believe is uh, the right approach for your, your security program. Other standards may be more strict, right? Some of the NIST standards have really specific guidance on like, you have to you know, follow specific SLAs or timelines for certain control sets. Um, you don't really have that in ISO. But from a topic perspective, you're gonna have, you know, again, 80% or more overlap with a lot of the other uh, standards. So that's why it's a great place to start. Um, and then to continue to mature and tweak over time as you bring in more frameworks and more uh, security requirements. Cool. So you actually have a follow-up for one of the earlier questions. Yeah. What is the URL again for them to get the free resources? Uh, phalanxgrc.com. There it is. And also for any of the videos or any of that content, they go to risk360.com. Yeah, risk360.com and click on the uh, resources tab. And one last question. Good one. Um, how do I get help for RISC 360 for my ISO? So again, you can, uh, you know, you can do a lot of your research. A lot of companies, you know, prefer to do a lot of research independently before they engage any external parties uh, for, for good reason. Uh, so we try to provide all that information you need in that resources tab. But once you're ready to start a conversation, if you believe that, you know, you need an internal auditor or you need some help with an implementation, um, you could, uh, again, come through the website. Um, there's like a form you can fill out there. Um, you know, we'll, we'll follow up with you and get in touch. Um, the most important thing is, you know, getting what your business needs uh, down on paper and making sure that, you know, regardless of who you work with or what you choose to do, that you're clear on what you need to do to, uh, you know, work with those stakeholders and, and fulfill their needs. And so they would like you to share that slide again with the link to GRC so they get the URL? Sure. Yeah. And I'll also send you a directly the link so you can check it out to everybody. Cool. cool. And that's it for all the questions. Awesome. Well, uh, next week or, or next month, rather, uh, we'll get into part two of this series where we talk about uh, everything you need to get ready for the ISO 27001 audit. So we'll take some of the generalized topics we hit on today and uh, break them down further. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate everyone showing up. Um, if you have any questions, you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, <laughs> should be easy to find. I'm the only Sawyer at Earth 360, so uh, shouldn't shouldn't be too much confusion there. Uh, but yeah, I would love to talk to you.